Well, good morning. Sorry to keep you from your lunches. Uh, let's tell you, I'd like to tell you what we're doing now with uh, FinFETs and how just possibly it might have some impact on the interests of this community. Okay, let's see. How do I make this go? There we go. So the summary of the talk is as follows. We're asking the question whether we can produce low-power uh, low logic simply by building FinFETs that are very tall and very close together. We're building fins in a process where the thickness of the films is controlled by atomic layer epitaxy. That's giving us nanometer control of the thickness of those fins. The process involves growth of those films, films on the sidewall wall of a semiconductor ridge, and that allows us to make those fins very tall indeed. So the implications of this is we can, we think, scale the body down to a few nanometers, allowing us to get the electrostatics we need for, say, eight nanometers, perhaps even less in gate length. And because the fins can be very tall and we hope to prove very close together, we will increase the drive current per unit IC die area. It would seem that that might allow you to directly reduce the area of your ICs because you need less transistor area to um, implement your integrated circuit. And thus, that would complement lithographic scaling. But the other way you can use it, is, which is probably more important, is having increased the drive current by simply <laughs> corrugating the surface of your semiconductor device you can then turn down the supply voltage while getting the same die area, just the same drive current per unit die area. So very, very quickly, um, here's the um, transistors we're building in the 3.5 center. We're getting about uh, almost three millisiemens per micron on current. These are planar devices. The question is, how would you go to a fin device? Okay. All right. So uh, if we're going to build uh, fin fets by atomic layer epitaxy, we need gate lengths that are body thicknesses that are less than about half the gate length, so that's about four nanometer body thickness. The threshold becomes very th sensitive to the body thickness. The mobility becomes very low, so we need to get atomically smooth interfaces. We need to get atomically con precise control over that. In the course of doing this, we realized that we could build very high current devices. Here's how we're building these transistors. We start with indium phosphide. We etch it with a facet selective etch to get um, absolutely vertical surfaces. We then grow on that template the indium gallium arsenide channel of the transistor using atomic layer epitaxy with, if we do it right, nanometer control, atomic layer control of the channel thickness. We then um, etch the gate region with a dielectric dummy gate, regrow the source and drain, remove the gate dielectric. We're left with this structure, and then we liberate the transistor fins from the growth template with a second selective etch. And I'm not showing you the back end of the process. So very, very quickly, I've just completely lost it. But I've already used three minutes, or did I miss set my stopwatch? Okay, I better really speed up. So here I'm showing you some of these transistors with about a 200 nanometer fin that's uh, tall that's about 8 nanometer thick. Here I'm showing you fins at about 50 nanometer and 100 nanometer thickness. Okay, so the first thing you can do with these is simply say, look, I'm getting very tall fins, so I'm getting a lot of current per fin, so I need less fins within a logic gate. So my footprints are smaller, so my die area becomes smaller, which directly helps me. If my die area is smaller, then my wires are shorter, and that helps me with CV squared. Is that significant? Well, it probably is significant for clock and interconnect drivers, but for other devices on the IC, it probably isn't. Logic gates and memory are drawn at minimum geometry, so this would help you in terms of power and die area only uh, within clock and interconnect drivers. Okay, so what's the second thing you can do is to use this increased area to simply turn down the supply voltage. And we've discussed this enough, so let's bring ourselves simply to the issue of subthreshold logic where we drop the supply voltage and suffer, as we've heard, reduced on current. Tunnel currents are another way of addressing the problem. As we've heard, the channel insurer is getting high on currents. Okay, if we've increased the surface area relative to the IC footprint area by a factor of 10, then we can reduce the supply voltage from roughly half a volt to slightly below 0.3 volts get the same on current and off current, not per unit transistor channel width, but per unit die area. Okay, so it would seem for a moment that we've affected roughly a 3.5 to 1 reduction in, in uh, CV squared dissipation. It's more subtle than that in that we must worry about the increased capacitances associated with these very tall, very highly interdigitated transistor structures. Using a gate delay and large signal capacitance model straight out of a textbook, Hodges and Jackson, I give you this gate delay expression. In the interest of time, I will simply uh, skip it and say it's entirely standard analysis and lead you through, now, through the analysis. I'm comparing a transistor on a half-volt supply with a 20 nanometer channel width 
to a transistor sitting on the same die area but with 10 times the width by turning it on its side. And we've dropped down the supply voltage to get the same on and off current, in both cases 20 microns in the two transistors. Okay, like so. All right. The capacitance to the inversion layer has gone up a little bit in this structure simply because that's Q stored over V and the supply voltage has gone down. But in either case, that capacitance is not very big. What's important is the gate to drain and gate to source fringing capacitances, which are now dominant in VLSI transistors, has got 10 times bigger. We've gone from 6 to 60 attofarads in doing that. Now the question is how long is your interconnect? So here I'm assuming a 10 micron light length wire that is open for discussion. That would give us about two femtofarads of wiring capacitance. And then when we include our fan in, fan out and Miller effect, what we find is that the total capacitance has gone from about 2.1 up to almost three femtofarads. It has increased, but we've reduced the supply voltage again from half a volt to about 0.3 volts or so. So the delay has slightly gone down. CD squared has gone down by roughly a factor of two and a half. In the absence of this increase in capacitance, it would have gone down by a factor of three and a half. Okay. So then the first question is, well, why do this? Why not just do subthreshold logic? Well, if we go subthreshold logic and keep with the planar device in dropping the supply, we've given ourselves one-tenth of the on current, and so our CV over I delay has got larger. Of course, the gate has got the, the logic has got slower, as we all know. So I say, fine, let's instead now increase the transistor periphery to get the current back. Now the problem is the die area has got 10 times bigger, which is also not acceptable, not to mention that your wires will therefore also get long, longer. Okay. So that brings me finally to the question of tunnel FETs, because in fact the discussion, the points I've made are generic and apply equally to tunnel FETs. Let's do a quick performance estimate. Let's assume that the tunneling probability across this barrier is about 10%. It's about what we see with the very, very best ohmics we need, about a half volt, a half nanometer tunnel barrier and about a 0.2 EV barrier to tunnel through. So if we do that, then you're going to give up something of order, best case, a factor of 10 in on current with those FETs. So if your on current is low and you don't corrugate the surface, you will give up tremendously in speed just with subthreshold voltage with the uh, subthreshold operation with the tunnel FETs. If you corrugate the surface in this fashion, now that low current can be compensated for by getting larger area of the tunnel FET per unit IC die area. So your wires are back shorter, but you are still suffering from larger inter-electrode capacitances within the transistor. And so the message here is one is if we're going to produce a low current device, we've got to worry about the impact on interconnect capacitance and on transistor inter-electrode capacitances. So I believe that summarizes my talk. And I've managed to step on the gas having started very slowly with eight minutes. So here I'm talking about thin FETs with atomic layer epitaxis, and I'm just repeating the points. Okay. Thank you very much. You said it can be applied uh, to uh, these types of uh, uh, inium gallium arsenide FETs. It can be applied to tunnel FETs, but it can also be applied to the current existing technology right. where you would end up having uh, uh, more milliamps per micron, more millisiemens per micron. So it opens up the possibility of increasing the clock speed that we have even within the uh, current technology. To the extent that you're interconnect rather than transistor capacitance right. limited. And I, I, I'm not a VLSI designer, and some of those answers depend on the, the logic designer, a place, person like Jan Rebay to give you clear answers on that. Yeah. All right. Any more questions? Total silence. Okay. All right. Well, I'm saying, you know, in addition to transport, we can also just simply use geometry. Okay. Well, thank you for your attention.